Welcome to the Interlocked Bible Study. We're starting a new lesson, Lesson 51. The focus is the kingdom of man destroyed. So previously, uh, we've been studying God's final revelation to mankind about uh, human history and how it ends. This is through the book of Revelation. The Lord Jesus Christ is the faithful uh, king of the kingdom of God. And after he receives the inheritance scroll from the Father, he, he breaks open the seven seals one by one. And by breaking each one of these seals, it also releases judgment uh, on the earth. So these judgments that we've uh, covered already in previous lessons and recordings, they are physical. They affect mankind, but not only mankind, but specifically also the nature, earth, earth itself. Uh, not just earth, but outer space or the, the sun, the moon, the stars, and not only just the the metaphysical, the you know the physical realm, the the earthly realm, the humanity, um, and and outer space, but it's also affecting the unseen spiritual realm. And so, God at this particular time, as Christ, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is going to take his, uh, his inheritance. God is judging the entire universe, all different spheres of the universe be it, albeit spiritual in the unseen realm or the physical or nature, the entire universe is coming under God's judgment. So while this tribulation period is focused on disciplining Israel specifically and making the Jews uh, come to faith in their Messiah and once and for all decide who is their Messiah, is it Jesus Christ? Is it someone else? Is it this uh, counterfeit Messiah that's coming we, that the Bible calls the Antichrist? Once and for all, now they have to make a choice. There is no other option. It's decision time. So we also see that the kingdom of man in this time frame is finally judged once and for all as well. So Jesus explains to John uh, what's happening in heaven. And, and in the spiritual realm, this unseen realm, and, and then he shows how this plays out on the earth. So in the chart in front of you, you see A, B, C, there's going to be a D here in, in this lesson, uh, capital letters, and then you're going to see the small letters uh, below. And so what takes place, what, what, what happens, these scenes, these visions that take place in heaven that John sees, are then played out on earth in a practical and very real way. So we've covered these three specific points so far and how they've impacted earth. And we're going to be covering another one here in this lesson. So through all these events and the time of tribulation, the, the Bible makes it clear that Yahweh is the one that's in complete and sovereign control. It's not man. It's not uh, this adversary known as the satan uh, it's not uh, a particular government or uh, individual it's really god who's is sovereign and in control and he actually is using some of these uh enemies of his that have proclaimed themselves as his enemy to accomplish his purposes so that's the interesting thing about the sovereignty of god he gives free will to man and to these spiritual beings known as uh, angels. However, however, none of them can supersede the will of God uh, in his overarching goals and plans. And to the point where those who are rebellious also become instruments of bringing about his purposes. So he allows this uh, counterfeit Messiah, counterfeit Christ, to rise up to power, and he's forcing the world to make a choice, to believe or not to believe, to claim uh, this earthly king as their king of kings and lord of lords, or Jesus Christ, the true Messiah, as uh, king of kings and lord of lords, and specifically Yahweh, the son of Yahweh, the son of God, not just 
another leader, not just another political ruler, but the ruler of the entire universe, both of the unseen and the seen realm. So if you see the chart in front of you, uh, we've covered a significant amount of distance from creation all the way to this final judgment section. And in this final judgment section, there's six lessons that we cover. And this lesson 51, just to help you understand where we're at in the scheme of things, is the second to the last and final lesson. And, and we're focused on the destruction of the kingdom of man. So God isn't done with uh, showing John uh, the future and what is to happen and to reveal to him information. There's more to come, and Jesus is going to describe the fall of Babylon and his second coming from Revelation chapter 17 all the way to chapter 19, 19 verse 10. So we're going to be covering uh, some of these scriptures uh, starting with uh, Revelation chapter 17, and it's going to follow this uh, rewind and show system that we've been doing, where, where uh, there's continual passes taken over this whole entire seven-year period known as the Tribulation, uh, interjecting, revealing more and more information about what's taking place during this time. So let's look at these. Let's read through this passage. We're going to read through 18 verses of chapter 17. So follow along with me as, as, uh, as I read through. Revelation 17, 1. <clears throat> One of the seven angels who had poured out the seven bowls came over and spoke to me. Come with me, he said, and I will show you the judgment that is going to come on the great prostitute who rules over many waters. Uh, the kings of the world have committed adultery with her, and the people who belong to this world have been made drunk by the wine of her immorality. So the angel took me in the spirit into the wilderness there I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that had seven heads and ten horns, and blasphemes against God were written all over it. The woman wore purple and scarlet clothing and beautiful jewelry made of gold and precious gems and pearls, and in her hand she held a gold goblet full of obscenities and the impurities of her immorality. A mysterious name was written on her forehead, Babylon, the great mother of all prostitutes and obscenities in the world. I could see that she was drunk, drunk with the blood of God's holy people who were witnesses for Jesus. I stared at her in complete amazement. Why are you so amazed? The angel asked. I will tell you the mystery of this woman and of the beast with the seven heads and ten horns on which she sits. The beast you saw was once alive, but isn't now. And yet he will soon come up out of the bottomless pit and go into eternal destruction. And the people who belong to this world whose names were not written in the book of life before the world was made, will be amazed at the reappearance of this beast who had died. This calls for a mind with understanding. Now, the seven heads of the beast represent the seven hills where the woman rules. They also represent seven kings. Five kings have already fallen. The sixth now reigns, and the seventh is yet to come, but his reign will be brief. The scarlet beast that was, but is no longer, is the eighth king. He is like the other seven. He too is headed for destruction. So the ten horns of the beast are ten kings who have not yet risen to power. They will be appointed to their kingdoms for one brief moment to reign with the beast. They will all agree to give him their power and authority. Together, they will go to war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will defeat them because he is Lord of all lords, King of all kings, and, and he, his called and chosen and faithful ones will be with him. 
So then the angel said to me, the waters where the prostitute is ruling represent masses of people of every nation and language. The scarlet beast and his ten horns all, all hate the prostitute. They will strip her naked, eat her flesh, <clears throat> and burn her remains with fire. For God has put a plan into their minds, a plan that will carry out his purposes. They will agree to give their authority to the scarlet beast, and so the words of God will be fulfilled. And this woman you saw in your vision represents the great city that rules over the kings of the world. Wow, so John John is shown a, a ton of information about what happens to Babylon, or the woman, uh, and specifically the Antichrist, or the Scarlet Beast, during the, the first half of the tribulation. So, but what exactly is Babylon, and, and why is it that Babylon is so important here in this scene? So, first of all, let's talk about Babylon. We learned about Babylon. We first heard about this city in Genesis chapter 10 and chapter 11. God had restarted mankind with believing Noah and his family with the global flood and to help them deal with the realities of evil and sin so as not to repeat history, hopefully, right? God's given mankind a second chance. He gave them a fourth divine institution and that is civil government. Yeah, that was back in Interlocked Bible Study Lesson 6. You can go back in prior recordings to cover that material. This, So this is to restrain evil within their society. Government, by God's standard, is good. Government is not a bad thing. However, mankind in their corrupt and fallen nature, living apart from God, uses civil government for their own purposes, their own evil agenda. So Babylon, the people of this time, um, instead of obeying and worshiping Yahweh and living in under accountability to him and his word and his Hit the fulfilling the design for which they were created to glorify God and be his image bearers. Unfortunately, most of Noah's descendants uh, decided to turn against God and, 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 and establish their own kingdom. God had instructed them at that time to, to be fruitful and multiply, basically have tons of kids, fill the earth with your descendants, and and spread out like spread out all over the the face of the entire earth the globe where there's physical lands and and dwell there uh take dominion over there exercise responsible dominion marriage and family civil government and they abused their powers instead of doing that they decided to organize themselves uh, and, and instead of limiting evil like was uh, the intent of civil government and punishing evil, they rebelled against God and established themselves as rulers and kings for their own personal agenda apart from God. So this tower that was made, that was constructed in honor of themselves as lord and king and ruler of the their, their territory and perhaps eventually the, the entire globe, this city was called Babel uh, or Babylon. Uh, this is what we covered in Lesson 7 of the Interlocked Bible Study. You may recall briefly that um, Babel is uh, its where we get the word to Babel, to confuse, it's chaos, it's, uh, it's total, total catastrophe and confusion and, and division. Uh, that's why we in the English language say, hey, man, that guy is just babbling on. I don't understand a word he's saying that comes from this biblical narrative and story and account from God's word. And this is where the word Babylon comes from, the city of Babylon. So they chose to be their own authority and the final authority of their lives. No one was going to rule over them, especially not Yahweh. And so this, this tower 
an altar and city known as Babylon, it represents man's kingdom, man's man setting himself up as God. It's a, it's that same temptation, Satan, the adversary, uh, and the serpent in the Garden of Eden tempted Eve with. He said, you know, you eat this fruit and you're going to be like God. You're going to be like God. God's God's messed with you. He's he's told you that you can't have this fruit. That he's he's not cool. That's not cool for God to withhold his power and his knowledge from you. You can be your own king and decide for yourself. So this is exactly following the pattern of uh, God's adversary Lucifer and and consequently the the man's nature apart from God. And so man builds his kingdom up. So this Babylon is a representation of man's kingdom. So in, if you recall, because of this rebellion in Babel, that God scatters them. He, he, he confuses their languages and he scatters the different nations all throughout the earth and they divide. And this we call tribal diversity. So this was to prevent mankind from continually organizing themselves at uh, at a world and global level uh, against God. Uh, so what you see today, this is parenthetical, what you see today in the global movement of globalism is a setting up of, of um, bringing together all the diverse tribal and ethnic groups and linguistical groups under one single uh, economy, one single government, one single leadership and 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 thought and philosophy, and it will all be directed toward anti Yahweh uh, to be um, set man up as the ultimate authority, apart from God, apart from his his prophets, apart from his word, apart apart from his his Messiah, Jesus Christ. So in spite of God scattering mankind uh, and people, they, they never really gave up this Babel fantasy that they had, mankind. Uh, so the idea of the, that mankind is the ultimate authority and can successfully dominate and rule without God is predominant in today's philosophy. And it's predominant in, in, in every ethnic group around the world, no matter where you go, whatever uh, isolated ethnic group that you find yourself in contact with, there is a, a ethnocentricity. Um, the, the ethnic group I grew up in was very ethnocentric, eth ethnocentric, uh, ethnocentric. Um, the Aceh people, the word Aceh is we the people. Uh, I also lived among an ethnic group called the Paita Butena, which means we the people. And literally within their, their cosmology and their worldview, the center of the earth is in the country called Paraguay and in a specific mountain. So you see that that these ethnic groups around the world are are set up to be anti God and embrace their own set themselves up as rulers and and uh, so you see this in the Americas with the Maya Empire the Aztec Empire uh, there's also the lesser known Guarani Empire that was further down in South America in the Amazon region. Uh, and then in the, we all know our European, uh, and some of the African and Asian, Asian empires that emerge. So this is intrinsic, intr intricately in, intertwined into mankind's anti God, um, uh, rebellious heart because of sin. It's because of Adam and Eve and their decision. And, and so the, the, the time frame that we're looking at here in Revelation, which is yet a future event for you and I today, is the setting up of an entire global uh, and bringing together of all religions, all tribal groups, ethnic groups, language groups together into one single um, uh, Babel fantasy. So you see this uh, coming to a level of fruition uh, with King Nebuchadnezzar. And Babylon became the leading empire of that time. All, all of its kings ruled in the same way. They were defiant towards Yahweh. 
The religious life and economical system of Babylon was in total opposite of God's purposes and, and, and his intent for mankind. They were repeating the same evil pattern of the original Babel and by perverting civil government, using the power of the sword and of force and of war, and, and instead of limiting evil and, and, and spreading, using power and influence to spread justice and to care for the poor and the needy and the widow, instead of uh, a civil government designed to care for those who, who have a difficult time caring for themselves in the sense of empowering them to become independent and useful uh, uh, collaborate, collaborators of society and contributors of society, uh, and, and interdependent with other members of, 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 uh, of society. A government instead uses their power to yield their power to dominate over other ethnicities and to amass wealth for themselves and fame. And you see this this pattern repeated over and over and over and over, especially with Babel um, um, and Babylon uh, through King Nebuchadnezzar's rule. So it didn't, in, instead of instead of limiting evil, it, instead evil was spread through the, the, the brutal and brutality and cruelty of the leaders of these nations. Each, each leader wanted to become the king of kings, and the Lord of Lords. They wanted to, to be set up as the final authority that no one else gets to tell me what to do. I, in turn, tell what everyone else has to do. And if you do not do what I say, there are heavy consequences. In many cases, it's off with the head. You lose your life. So Babylon, um, other names for Babylon uh, include Babel, Shinar, etc. Is the it's the second most mentioned city in the Bible. It's mentioned two hundred and ninety times in the Bible. Like it's over and over and over. This is a, a a theme all throughout Scripture. This Babel, this representation of man's kingdom being set up against the kingdom of God. Uh, so the picture that the Bible gives Babylon is pretty bad. It's kind of a, a, a negative picture. It represents greed. It represents sexual immorality. Like constantly you see this, uh, this sexual freedoms that are expressed instead of uh, a one man, one woman in, in marriage as God designed Adam and Eve you see this uh, free-for-all sexuality and sensuality uh, with food, you name it, just do whatever your heart tells you that you desire and want. Uh, you see that prevalent through all, all these different kingdoms that were rose up. Uh, more, more recent history was the, the Roman kingdom and the Grecian kingdom, where there's recorded um, practices of those cultures at that time. And it's, so it represents greed, sexual immorality, false religion. And a lot of these religions as well, you had the goddesses of fertility. Uh, so the very idols and, 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 and lords, if you will, these, these uh, little Elohims, these Baals, these lords of this, this time encouraged uh, f f sexual freedom um, and brutality and cruelty. So the religion fell right into play with this. And then, and, and these the Babylon represents just complete rebellion against man, uh, of mankind against their creator. So it's not a pretty picture. Uh, when we when we think of Babel, when we think of that city, we think of mankind's condition. It's not in the Bible. It's not put in a positive light. In fact, it's always used for the opposite. So at the Tower of Babel, if if God had left mankind to their own wicked ways, they they would have continually ignored Yahweh. And instead, further taught and convinced each other uh, of this fatal lie that mankind can indeed rescue themselves, save themselves, uh, set themselves up for success through their own wisdom and through their own works and through their own laws and through their own taking control of their own destiny. 
This is a lie from the pits of hell. This is a lie from the Satan, the Lucifer, the one who set himself up against God in heaven and that led other angelic beings into rebellion against God. The, these sons of God that he created, uh, that, that the Satan led into rebellion. This is what they bought into. And mankind is bought into the same theo this, this, yeah, theology in the sense that it's setting themselves up as theos, the, the God. And, uh, but unfortunately, man cannot save himself. And this is, this is what we see history repeating the over and over the Bible, the theme, one of these key central themes of the Bible is that man cannot save himself. Man following his own ideas can only lead to destruction. There's only one result of man just doing his own thing. And that is destruction. Man does not have the ability to save himself and to redeem himself. The only way is to be reconciled, to, to be put back into right relationship with the creator, Yahweh. That's the only way, and it requires humility. And this is this babble is the opposite of humility. It's pride. It's arrogance. And, and the arrogant has to humble themselves and say, I, I don't have the answers. I am not the final authority. I do not have have uh, the decision here i am I'm, i am um uh, uh, i'm i'm accepting an external solution an external decision one who is greater than myself one who is my creator and and who is the ultimate authority and who has the final say in all things i submit my will to his will i submit my ideas to his ideas that takes humility and of mankind, if you're not willing, if I'm not willing to humble myself, you're not willing to humble yourself before the Almighty God, you're going to find yourself working against God and not for him. And you'll find yourself in the same destination that all who rebel against God find themselves in, and that is a, 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 a destruction, separation from God in the lake of fire where, where all evil will be contained um once and for all i don't i certainly don't want to find myself there so today is the day of repentance today is the day of humility today is the day to say i'm sorry I, god I, for my arrogance i need you i'm sorry for setting uh myself up for my own uh success and and renown and and so that people will love and respect me and, and, and to set up forth my own agenda. I'm going to die to that, 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 those glory babble, tower of babble uh, ideologies. And I'm going to accept your will. I'm going to exchange that for the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm going to accept that, that for the, uh, to, 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 to place myself at the feet of the Messiah and and the the will of the, the Spirit of God in my life, so the, the the ramifications to this goes very 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 deep, and this is what what God is talking about with John as he's explaining these different uh, scenes in heaven, and I trust it helps you kind of wrap your minds around uh, what, what what is God's opinion of pride? What is God's opinion of Babylon? And what is the destination of man's man's kingdom and setting up ourselves as, as the final authority? So the Bible uses the city uh, of Jerusalem as kind of like the total opposite of babylon so jerusalem the the city jerusalem was not always under the power of 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 um historically speaking of people of yahweh okay however the city and and the the language of jerusalem and the references to jerusalem are representative of a city uh that is a that is representative of the kingdom of God, that is humble, that is that accepts Yahweh as the authority. The, the actual name, Jerusalem, is, is in English the city of peace. This, this is from taken from Hebrew. This it's the city of Shalom. <clears throat> it is where the, the uh <clears throat> when God Yahweh reigns, 
when his kingdom is brought into into um, uh, into a, 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 what's that called a dominion or administrative oversight when when he's the administrator and his ways are the administration the natural consequence is peace not babble not babbling and chaos and 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 uh, destruction and vile vile prostitution <clears throat> but rather the, a virtuous bride who's focused on 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 peace and justice and love and, and and centralizes the character and nature of god as the the rules for engagement <clears throat> So Jerusalem represents the kingdom of God. Babylon represents the kingdom of man. Jerusalem is mentioned in the Bible 802 times. So uh, uh, it is very key and central to the whole of Scripture as, as it is uh, very important in the biblical, overarching biblical meta narrative of God. Jerusalem and the setting up of God's kingdom on earth. We're going to see that in, an, in in the next lesson, how God establishes, firmly establishes his kingdom. And Jesus, the Messiah, will rule and reign, not from Babylon, but from Jerusalem, the city of peace. So <clears throat> where is Babylon today? So following what God revealed to Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel regarding the future kingdoms of man, Babylon was overtaken by Medo-Persia, uh, later on Greek, uh, and then Rome, etc. So this, this Medo-Persia uh, Persian um, takeover was, happened in 539 BC. And since then, Babylon has not been in existence as a nation however 20 years after the fall of babylon god gave the prophet zechariah a vision of the future when evil would return to its original place in babylon okay so it's it's like there is this beautiful and wonderful city set up by king nebuchadnezzar known as babylon um, it was destroyed but now with Zechariah, he's 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 showing uh, through a vision that God reveals to him that this Babylon will be reconstructed and reestablished. So Zechariah sees a woman named Wickedness uh, who's carried to this city, this this in this future event called Babylon. Let's read Zechariah chapter five, verses five to eleven. Then the angel, who is talking with me came forward and said look up and see what's coming well, what is it i asked he replied it's a basket for measuring grain and it's filled with the sins of everyone throughout the land then the heavy lead uh, th then the heavy lead cover was lifted off the basket and there was a woman sitting inside it the angel said the woman's name is wickedness and he pushed her back into the basket and closed the heavy lid again. Then I looked up and saw two women flying toward us, gliding on the wind. They had wings like a stork, and they picked up a basket and flew into the sky. Where are they taking the basket? I asked the angel. He replied, to the land of Babylon, where they will build a temple for the basket. And when the temple's ready, they will set the basket there on its pedestal. So you see some real similarities between this uh, woman of Babylon uh, in Revelation and the, this woman that's taken to Babylon in Zechariah. Let's look at uh, some of these um, some of these similarities. Look at the chart in front of you. Uh, let me zoom in on the top three real quickly. So in Zechariah chapter 5 and Revelation chapter 17 and 18, you have a woman sitting in a basket in Zechariah, and you have a woman sitting on a beast uh, in Revelation. You have in Zechariah emphasis on commerce, which is a basket and measuring grain, etc. And you've got emphasis on commerce in Revelation as well. 
You in Zechariah, you have a woman's name is wickedness, and in Revelation, the woman's name is Babylon the Great, the mother of all prostitutes and obscenities of the world. So you see these very wicked, similar character traits. Let's look at the last two. In Zechariah, you see the the focus on false worship. A temple, for example, is set up uh, for the woman in the basket, a pedestal. Uh, and, and in Revelation, you see this false uh, worship system set up of the beast. Uh, a woman is taken to Babylon, and and then in Revelation, a woman is called Babylon. So the the there's this real close similarity, as if it's talking about the very same event, the same situation. So it appears that God will one day allow a real city of Babylon to be rebuilt and revived before the tribulation period. It could possibly be in the modern day region of Iraq, that Middle Eastern region, right? Um, it, there's, it could be in the historical location of Babylon. Um, and it, it, it'll, be, it'll be this headquarters of the Antichrist. Um, it will once again represent the kingdom of man. So Babylon will be the city and the system of evil that it, it's known for. And, and following what it has always done in history, Babylon is going to rise up and defy God, Yahweh. So if this is supposed to happen before the tribulation, the reconstruction of this city, Oh, man, where is it? I, I don't want to, in this recording, in this lesson, uh, begin building conspiracy theories about maybe it's this city, maybe it's this city, maybe it's that, maybe it's that, or this, or so-and-so. But definitely be aware that the likelihood of the reconstruction of this amazing, absolutely amazing city, it's going to be amazing because it's going to be a financial and economical hub. It's going to be a center of religion. It's going to be the center of, of mankind's unity at a global level. It, it's going to be moving toward that direction. So we're, uh, it'll, it'll be the rise of a new empire. Let's go uh, and talk a little bit about the Scarlet Beast. And, and uh, I don't know how far we'll get in this particular recording on this, but uh, we'll begin this section and then we'll continue on with further recordings. So the Scarlet Beast, I mean, who is this guy? What is this? Uh, you've got all these heads. You've got all these horns that come out. It's, it's bright red. So the details of this beast come from Revelation chapter 17, verse 8, and they tell us um, that this is the Antichrist. We can, we can clearly come away with that picture. Uh, he's this first beast, the one that rises up out of the sea, that we learned about in Revelation chapter 13. So we've already covered this in past lessons on Revelation. Let's read Revelation chapter 17, verse 8 uh, again. It says, The beast you saw uh, was once alive, but isn't now. And yet he will soon come up out of the bottomless pit and go into eternal destruction. And the people who belong to this world, whose names were not written in the book of life, before the world was made, we'll be amazed at the appearance or reappearance of the beast who had died. So this beast is going to uh, die and, and go to the abyss, and then he's going to come back alive again. And when he does that, people are just going to be blown away, and they're going to start worshiping because, I mean, who else could he be but maybe God or a God or some sort of uh, mighty, powerful uh, being that uh, is worthy of our worship. And so the nations of the, around the world are going to worship him, this Antichrist. But what does it mean that the beast has seven heads? Why seven? Okay, let's, let's look back again to Revelation 17, verses 9 uh, to 11. This calls for a mind of, with understanding. The seven heads of the, of the beast represent the seven hills where the woman rules. They are also represent the seven kings. So that's that's where the focus is. It's on, on individual kings. And of course, kings represent kingdoms. <clears throat> Verse 10, 
Five kings have already fallen, six now reigns, and the seventh is yet to come, but his reign will be brief. The scarlet beast uh, that was, but is no longer, is the eighth king. He is like the other seven, and he too is headed for destruction. Okay, so the first clue is that the seven are connected to the beast and his kingdom. And so they're kind of like his heads. They're, it's, it's like different generations of leaders and, and man, king, the kingdom of man are represented by these kings and these heads. So the second clue that we see of who it is is the, the five kings have already fallen. And this tells us that the earlier versions of the kingdom of man have already passed. Uh, so if you remember Nebuchadnezzar's dream and, and Daniel's interpretation of that, uh, he saw five kingdoms starting with his own, you know, the gold head, uh, Babylon, Medio Persia, Greece, Rome. We know this by looking in the past. Now the revive Rome is yet a future event for us. And then the kingdom of God and uh, son of man of Jesus Christ is yet a future kingdom for us as well. Future event. So uh, who are the other two heads? Okay, if there's five and we know about them, who are the other two? Well, uh, before Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, before he set up Babylon as kind of like the king of kings and lord of lords at that uh, of, of the known world at that time, there were other kingdoms set in, in, in motion and superpowers, and Egypt was the number one. You recall the, the, time, of, uh, the time of the pharaohs. Uh, Egypt was very renowned throughout the world at that time and dominant too. And then there was Assyria. Assyria was big. Uh, Assyria was one of those that took captive uh, the Israelites, um, the, the northern kingdoms. They, they captured them and took them into, um, into captivity. So Assyria was a big time ruler at that time. And so when Babylon comes into play, Babylon squashing Egypt and Assyria and taking complete power of the, the known world at that time. So that puts together all seven kingdoms. Uh, and then the Scarlet Beast is the final eighth kingdom. So why does the Scarlet Beast have 10 horns? Okay, so where does that go? come into play. You see this in verses 12 and 13 of seven, chapter 17, the 10 horns of the beast are the 10 kings who have not yet risen to power. They will be appointed to their kingdoms for one brief moment to reign with the beast. They will all agree to give him their power and authority. So this is part of the new revived Rome, which you and I do not see today. We're not, we do not have a global power in place today right now at the time of this recording but if you do see this recording after the fact uh, you may be able to have the opportunity to see the rise of a kingdom this revived rome uh, the seventh kingdom and and it, it, it's comprised of this alliance or coalition uh, so these these men, I assume, or leaders are voted in or or are established by their respective kingdoms, whatever that looks like. Right now we have continents and and all a lot of uh, fragmented independent nations around the world. Some are are more powerful and influential than others. Some are have greater economical uh, capacity than others. Some have higher levels of influence than others, but in general, you you see a lot of uh, country centric. In other words, uh, uh, like politically, we had uh, Donald Trump as as a as a as a a, a a leader of the United States who who brought in a philosophy uh, uh, where we make America great again. Okay, so what you see is is let's uh, let's focus on, uh, on home. And then you see uh, w with the Biden administration, a global perspective where where billions of dollars are infused into countries like Ukraine or Israel. And uh, whereas a Donald Trump's philosophy is to invest at home, strengthen our ties at home, our economy at home, uh, and issues that are happening within. So you see these different philosophies arise. Whatever, I use that as, as an example, as an illustration of how the countries 
uh, uh, there will be 10 primary influential kingdoms around the world. Uh, maybe those in turn are also comprised of of coalitions. It could be a coalition of coalitions, you know, like maybe um, the European Union uh, identifies a single representative. And then that single representative is uh, uh, is voted into power. And then that individual in turn gives his power and authority to the Antichrist. So I'm going into some unnecessary detail right now as far as the the, uh, surmising probabilities, but I trust it helps you understand the the scene, uh, the type of environment that's necessary for 10 leaders, 10 key influential leaders that have influence at a global and international level to uh, be voted into power and then to very quickly hand over their power and authority to a single individual uh, uh, known as a global global leader. Now, he probably won't be called a dictator immediately, but recognized as a global democratic leader, um, all, a, a man of the people. But then later you see uh, you see the the iron fist coming out as the tribulation progresses. So this is this is the environment and context of which uh, a revived Rome uh, will then hand over their power and authority to this final and eighth king. And so that's where the horns come in. So we're going to stop there right now. We've, we're going to cover in our next recording uh, the Antichrist versus versus Babylon. And, and uh, it's, it's come back for the next recording because it's fascinating. This Antichrist, uh, he, he's being ridden by... Uh, the the woman, this prostitute, this this uh, this this figure of Babylon is be, is controlling uh, and and is riding this beast, and we're going to see some tension between the beast and and Babylon, and uh, and what happens after that. So stay tuned for the next recording. God bless you.